Hi, I'm Mark Madison. I'm the historian at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at the National Conservation Training Center. And this weekend we're hosting the American Conservation Film Festival. And our favorite film of the festival, the Best of Fest winner, uh, was a film called The Serengeti Rules. And I'm very fortunate to have the filmmaker, Nicholas Brown, uh, joining me briefly to talk about this film. It actually got the uh, Green Fire Award, which I named uh, 15 years ago after right. Aldo Leopold as, as one of our inspirations. And I can't think of a film that actually has fit a Leopoldian award as well. <laughs> Leopold really introduced ecology to the public and the Serengeti Rules is, is really attempting um, to teach the public about the new field of conservation biology in a, in a very uh, enchanting way. So, so Nicholas, yeah. give us a brief synopsis of what the film's about. Uh, well, the film, we, we don't use terms like uh, conservation biology or, or trophic cascades or any of the sort of technical terms because we are trying to appeal to a, a very broad audience. So we, we, even though it's about trophic cascades, we banned the word trophic or cascades because I, I, you know, when I started, I didn't know what that meant. Sure, I, a lot of people don't. But essentially, it's about how nature is put together, and there are uh, five biologists or, or ecologists that we look at in particular, and and, and and kind of go through their lives some fifty odd years. And, and one of them we were talking about, Jim Estes, yeah. uh, worked very closely with with your department, and. Um, uh, essentially their experiences around the world in understanding how nature is put together uh, could be leading towards I mean some people would even go to say there's there's some sort of a unifying theory there potentially for ecology um, but certainly one of the one of the interesting things about the science that we're trying to communicate apart from the characters and, and their love and passion for nature is the is, is the fact that you know this science now it, it would it's not going to be interesting anymore to find yet another place where trophic cascades occur. Yeah. The interesting thing will be if anyone can find a place that it doesn't. It, it just seems to be that everywhere we look now, we see nature structured in these ways where there are these keystone species that play an incredibly important role. And it, it leads us to think about, I think, uh, what the possibilities are really underlying nature because so, for example, in the Serengeti, when the Serengeti was first kind of uh, being studied by Tony Sinclair in the 60s, you know, wildebeest weren't even a, a species that you bothered to count. Right. There, were, there weren't enough of them, you know. And, and then suddenly they, they, they removed the Rindepest uh, virus from that area with an inoculation around the park. And suddenly the, the wildebeest start climbing in numbers. And uh, this was not something that anyone could have imagined. And studying it, they couldn't, they couldn't figure out what's going on. But the next year they came back, there were 200,000. The next few years, then there were 400,000, then there were 800,000, then there were 1.2 million. And working in a migration pattern, which was key to the sort of success of that ecosystem, that's something that no, there's, there's no, hardly any real migrations left. And the Serengeti has this one, and it makes it a, an incredible place to study because we start to see that nature is put together in ways that we didn't heretofore think. We, we thought of nature from the bottom up and in that one paradigm, and now we're seeing that there is this top-down layer that we really need to pay attention to. And I think to those in your audience who are conservation biologists or who have their hands on the lever, as it will, um, you know, it's paying attention to those keystone species that might give you the bang for the buck, and it might uh, bring about restorations that heretofore we've never seen uh, the potential of nature to be so biodiverse or powerful and potent. There's two things about keystone species mm -hmm. that, are, that are important. One might be a succinct definition, in case there's people that right. see this outside. And the other is, I think will surprise conservation biologists, is that it's a discovered concept <laughs> and that it hasn't been around forever and, and your film points out quite rightly there was a, a kind of a confluence of biologists and factors that led them to discover this concept so maybe okay, define well, it I'll start us. with I'll start with keystone species I mean I am not a biologist I don't profess to be an expert on it and I know that the definition and the word has been controversial in some respects because you know you, you suddenly everything is a keystone and you kind of point out, oh, that's got to be right. a key. But as I understand it, a keystone is a species that does exert uh, an inordinate um, influence on its environment. 
and its presence by which can literally, I, I, I like to think of it in terms of, um, you know, the, the, some of my colleagues are, who, who worked on the film with me are physicists, and they, they, they talk in physics of, of um, steady states, and there can be two kind of steady states or alternate states for, for various environments, as, as I understand it. And, what, and the keystone is, is kind of a, a key species that makes the difference. So, for example, you might have, a, a, like a, in Bob Payne's original work, uh, he originally encountered a tide pool that had 15 species in it and was in a, what I'd call a high biodiverse state. Yeah. Steady state, it, it was clicking along just fine. Um, and then he did a perturbation, he did an experiment and he removed the top predator, he removed the, the ochre starfish, yeah. Pisaster ochreaceus. And by removing that uh, one species, within a few years, he suddenly had, saw a complete collapse in the biodiversity of that environment to where there was just the California mussel. Um, so the film goes into this and, and explores it then in other environments, but the principle is, is that if you have a keystone within an environment, you it, it, it protects the biodiversity um, and and uh, sort of makes room or allows for more biodiversity than you sometimes can even imagine. Um, and in the case of the Serengeti, it was, you know, the multipliers were, were you know, it, it'd be really interesting comparing the Serengeti, for example, yeah. to say Yellowstone. Uh, Yellowstone, we put in one predator and we saw kind of extraordinary right. results. You put back a, a, a wolf and suddenly Streams are running clear. Willows and aspens are returning. Right. Cottonwoods returning. So you you know you don't think these things are connected, um, but but then you go to uh, somewhere like the Serengeti, where they have multiple predators, and it's actually the herbivore you put back, yeah. and suddenly you have a an upgrading of the system largely because these animals are able to migrate, and that. That takes a pretty big park. <laughs> it takes a lot of land, <laughs> yeah. and it takes uh, you know it's it's a conservation on a really grand scale. But um, this is the way we need to dream and think because uh, I think um, you know uh, the pressures that that the, the world is under, as I mentioned before, where our population pressures and, and land pressures, habitat pressures are such that uh, we need to get on top of this science right away. Yeah. And how has it come out of the '60s? What 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 factors led to this simultaneous discovery of keystone species among these? I think what happened, as, far, as I understand it from the, in your historian of ecology, you understand that, like, um, Tony Sinclair kind of learned from Elton, and mm -hmm. I think in, in Elton's time and then beyond, uh, up until the 60s, the large, largely, um, largely what ecologists were doing, because we were just trying to get a hold of the complexity of things was was by and large, I mean it's derisively called stamp collecting, but it's kind of this idea where you kind of, what's there, how does it live, how does it, and, and Elton started to put together like little food pyramids and, and, and understand, okay, so, you know, this might connect to that. Um, Darwin actually understood, in a, in a little part of the, the um, origins of species, he describes uh, things about uh, clovers and Cats and mice. Yeah, basically. <laughs> it's a famous and, passage, yeah. Yeah, and he's basically just looking at a, a, a bit of this sort of trophic cascade. But, but, I mean, we might have understood it, but nobody was really yet experimenting. And along comes Bob Payne, and I'm not, I, I, don't, I don't think he was the first person to experiment in nature, but he certainly was one of the first to kind of go, um, you know, I could do a study here where I can manipulate the environment and... Um, and, and see what happens. And that's why his work is so well respected, because not only did he do the study where he removed the starfish, he had a control, and then he did separate experiments where he removed other species and, and nothing happened. Um, so he knew he had this one result, and, he, you know, and then it just became a question of, is this just tide pools or is it everywhere? And as the film goes into, we, 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 we kind of are now seeing this everywhere. So um, whether it's you know, blue crabs and snails and salt marshes, or it's uh, you know the Aleutian Islands, or it's uh, you know the rainforest. We're we're seeing these these trophic cascades. So the science is really robust. The science is really instructive. The question then becomes: Can we use that science 
for conservation purposes to make places more resilient to change because climate's changing and um, and, and you know the world is changing so uh, it's an incredibly important idea. Yeah. It's it, what's most exciting about your film, I think, both to historians of science and biologists, <laughs> which yeah. I'm both, is to see such an important science at its creation. Yeah. Uh, you know, trophic cascades, keystone species, they become as important to our understanding of the world as some of Darwin's concepts. And, and you did a great job uh, about showing it at its creation. Where did you get the idea of, of telling a scientific story through the scientists themselves? Um, so the, 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 the idea originally came from a book by Sean Carroll called mm -hmm. The Serengeti Rules. Um, Sean is in the movie. Uh, we, we decided not to take the whole book right. uh, and, and to just focus on basically scale it back and just focus on the, the five people who, as you said, um, have a, each of them has a, 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 a lifetime's worth of work. And I'm thinking now of Bob Payne, who actually passed away during the making of the movie. We actually were fortunate enough to, I mean, I, I get emotional when I think about it. It was only, it was right at the beginning of the project when Bob uh, came down with leukemia and we thought, you know, how are we going to make this film without him? We thought of even canceling the movie um, because we got an email saying from from his one of his daughters saying, you know, he's really ill. He probably won't make it through the night. Um, you know, you should cancel the shoot. And we did cancel the shoot, and then we got this extraordinary email from Bob himself saying, "Please come. Uh, I can do this." He was incredibly ill. He had about uh, um, 20 minutes a day where he could of hold himself together with the pain and everything and um, agreed to interview us you know in the last minutes of his life to be honest and there was also a whole herd of, of who's who in science waiting yeah. in the in the lobby behind me to kind right. of also say goodbye you know, you know he influenced everyone sure. um, uh, but we got these precious moments with Bob and and got this insight one of the things he said was what made this group so special, the group of scientists that we chose, is that each of them had a place that they knew intimately, loved, and cared for. It's this idea of ecology of, of place. They had fidelity and love for one uh, ecosystem that they knew over a period of, in, in most of their cases, 50 years plus. And that gives you insights because you can be there when change happens and then you really can see how nature works when you're there when change happens. In Jim's case, Jim Estes, he was there when his entire system collapsed due to a, a shift that he hypothesizes happened you know, well before he even arrived. But it was this slow lag of uh, you know, shifting predators and prey uh, in a cascading effect which are called trophic cascades. Yeah. You know? And uh, you know, even as he was studying otters, he didn't realize that the trap had already been set for the otters to, to, be, to yeah. disappear in his environment. But then he was there to see it, and he documented it. And his data is impeccable. Yeah. And you get this body of work where you just, you, just, you know, this stuff is not, uh, you know, it's not just ideas. This is data. This is stuff that, um, it's gold. It's like, you know, it, it, you, you, you look at their work and um, it only can happen through a lifetime of study. And uh, that's why it's so valuable to have because, you, you know, we know we can believe it. We know why we can believe it and we know w w where the data comes from. Uh, and, you know, there's a new generation now of, of ecologists yep. who, are, who are taking up that mantle. and. Um, there's new techniques. I know. I, I know ecologists in London who never leave the cafe. They just use yeah. the uh, internet and right. log onto the um, the remote sensing data of other people who are putting them on yeah. on animals. And and that's great. That's a one way of doing it. Uh, um, but to really understand how nature works, um, you know, we really we need those thinkers. And I, I think in the film you see five extraordinary thinkers who nobody really they aren't like big public figures necessarily, but they sure are geniuses and smart, and they, they worked out uh, things about, like you say, with ecology and how the world works, that you know, it, it has that significance of, of um, you know, obviously the Darwin's ideas, there are many ideas that, you know, there were 
there were Leopold's ideas, there were uh, Elton's ideas, there were E.O. Wilson's ideas. Right. Um, these are all kind of big landmark ideas. Um, but I think the I think that this idea of the Trophic Cascade is, is here to stay for a while at least, and um, uh, and understanding it quickly, being able to uh, being able to react um, is is really crucial. So you know, again, I, I think it's great the public can see it, but I really think it's great this audience can can see the movie if they can. I think that's an eloquent way to go out. Uh, basically. Uh, the passion of the scientists, hopefully, yeah. uh, the old timers, yeah. <laughs> some of whose equipment we have back here, going back yeah, to the do, '60s. Yeah. Hopefully, uh, that'll uh, work its way through this film to the, the current ecologists out there facing increasingly daunting <laughs> issues themselves. But at least they have this new theoretical framework to work with, which really has transformed how we do our conservation work. So. Yeah, Thank you for this absolutely. wonderful film and this tool <laughs> to Great. help us do our job better. And I hope the public, you know, if the public gets behind this too, it makes yeah. your job easier, right? So, so if people understand, there's a quote at the end of the film, we need to understand how to get from intolerance, where we are now, to tolerance. And I think about programs like the Red Wolf program and, and some of the other programs that you all have. And um, I... I'd really like to see those those things being implemented. I, I just want to say one thing. You know, um, we're in the east. Uh, there's Lyme disease around, and uh, there was a study that came out not too long ago that looked at the red wolf as being a possible interrupter for the cycle of the Lyme disease. You know, it, it, it reduces the coyotes. You get more foxes. More right. foxes eat more mice, and, and that vector goes down. And um, so these things have health implications. So if they're implemented by you guys. If the program survive, uh, you know the Red Wolf program is struggling, but some let's let's get it back. Let's uh, let's protect uh, that species, and um, maybe it can be used to prevent such diseases as, as Lyme disease. You know, these things can have real world consequences for everyone. Great message. Thank you. Great. We've been speaking Thanks. with Nicholas Brown. Thanks. His film is called The Serengeti Rules. It's showing tonight at the American Conservation Film Festival, repeating next week. Um, it won our Best of the Festival Award, the Green Fire Award, and it's a wonderful film. I hope you all get a chance to see it.